introduce power scale soaring to people that perhaps don't know too much about the sport. It is quite a niche division of slope soaring, which of course is a small division of radio control flight. So uh, great opportunity today to introduce that to uh, a wider audience and in quite a different media method as well. We've given presentations, <clears throat> excuse me, before at, uh, at public houses in the past, but never on, uh, on electronic Zoom media like tonight. So hopefully all the uh, IT will work fine. Uh, just a very brief introduction uh, to myself. So yeah, thank you. Uh, Phil Cook, uh, I'm a 48 year old uh, mechanical design engineer living in the Derby area and working in the Derby area for some time here, uh, here with my wife, Emma and two children uh, in Ripley. Uh, I've been flying models for over 35 years. Uh, I started out as a spotty teenager flying with my dad. Uh, started power flying at our club, South Cheshire Radio Control Society near Middlewich, uh, and also slope soaring at the local Leek and Moorlands uh, Club up near Elkstone in Staffordshire. Uh, and that's really where we generated our love for, for slope soaring together. Uh, and then soon after, PSS came on as a, as a natural byproduct for slope soaring. Uh, although I've flown many different disciplines in radio control flying uh, from IC power through electric uh, scale soaring, all different types of sports models. Power scale soaring has always held uh, a very close uh, part of, uh, to me in my heart. And uh, I think I've been a, a, an active member of the PSSA since its early days, perhaps 1988, 89, I think I joined. Uh, I did have a break from flying for a few years during university studies, 92 to 96. Uh, but uh, once I was in employment, I was very keen to get back uh, into flying and designing and building models, uh, particularly PSS types. Uh, unfortunately, the association lost its founder, Alan Hume, in 2010, who sadly passed away. Uh, and at that stage, I, uh, I took over as event coordinator for the PSSA and also do a lot of work for the website, uh, which you'll see some evidence of today. So uh, that's just a little bit about, uh, about me and my background in model flying. Uh, and if, uh, if that's OK, we'll, we'll move on. So I'll start with the basics. You know, some people I'm sure perhaps not familiar with power scale soaring at all. So what do we what do we mean by by that term? Uh, for me, power scale soaring is just an extension of slope soaring in general, really, radio control slope soaring. But it's an exciting division of that sport in that we we fly aircraft types that really are designed uh, to have engines fitted within them, uh, whether that's uh, uh, jets or piston engines or even rocket powered aircraft uh, all all aircraft types uh, fit the bill apart from power gliders that doesn't quite pass the ethics test uh, for our type of sport uh, with their with their natural glider abilities but really anything is fair game other than those uh, those types and of course that lends itself beautifully to a massive wide scope of opportunity uh, one of the very best things about PSS flying is you never see two models the same. Even if two models have been built from the same plan, uh, they're typically finished in different schemes, different methods and, and different levels of finesse. And so all the, all the models that we fly are completely bespoke uh, and, and each model has a story and, and each uh, pilot or owner of the model has a relationship with that model, which uh, is, is quite special, really. Uh, so it's very different to the type of club flying that you might see at the weekend where you'll see three or four Watt 4s all with the same ARTF color scheme. The, the, these models are all very different, very bespoke. Still, some, some of them are very quick and easy to put together. Equally, some of them are museum standard with many hundreds or even thousands of hours work uh, in them. And we do crazy things like climb to the top of the Great Storm and throw it off, as you can see there, top left-hand picture, uh, scale hurricane being thrown off the Great Storm over the pier at Landudno. Some people do think we're crazy, I'm sure, but uh, we have great fun. And we fly these models in a manner which uh, brings us great pleasure, uh, as I'm hoping the pack today uh, demonstrates. Just a little bit of history. We'll come on to a bit more detail about uh, how PSSA started, but uh, I just wanted to set the scene with three bullet points, really. Uh, my understanding is the first records of power scale soaring in the UK started around the mid 1970s. Uh, I've always struggled a little bit with that exact date because I was made aware of a book which uh, Chaz Gardner wrote many years ago. And in that book was a section about slope soaring. And in that section was a picture of a chap holding what looked like a, a slope scale uh, Caravelle airliner. Uh, and that was pre mid 1970s. That was probably early 70s or even late 1960s, uh, but unverified. And, and there was no reference to the term PSS or power scale soaring. I think they called them slope jets or, or something else from memory. Uh, 
Uh, but go on, we, 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 we credit the start of PSS proper in the UK, uh, mid 1970s. The first record I have personally is this photograph, which was taken by Alan Hume. Uh, this is at Malt Point in 1979, and it's an unknown modeler actually uh, launching a fallen gnat from that great slope site off the North Devon coast. Uh, that's, uh, that's the first evidence I have to hand, and it's uh, the picture that we reference on our website is really the, the start of PSS as, as we know it. The Cluid Soin Association took the bull by the horns and they were the first club to hold dedicated PSS events from 1983. A guy called Ray Jones was at the helm there and there's, a, there's an old wives tale, again unverified by me, but uh, there were flying sports models at, at Mulvama uh, and, and the, the story is that they were passed by a full-size Dakota below the height of the slope in the valley and it just got the guys thinking as to what the art of the possible was flying scale models as gliders from the slope side. So that's that's the uh, the old wives tale behind how it will happen. But uh, there was uh, good growth and, and, and good uh, good clubs, sorry, good events run by that club from 1983 and annually from that point for some time. I'll come on to that a little bit more. The Power Scale Soaring Association itself wasn't formed until 1986. Uh, you'll see the reason why uh, with the various developments across the UK. Obviously this was all pre-social uh, media, pre-internet, and, and it, there was a, a need to bring information together and, and common learning, which, uh, which the association formation helped uh, through a very simple newsletter, or using snail mail, of course, and uh, a very small number of members at that time. I often get asked why I like PSS so much. Uh, because you know, being honest, PSS models don't, they're not the best flying gliders that I have in, in, in the garage downstairs. Uh, you know, they're not the best performing machines at times and they can be awkward and tricky. But, but for me personally, uh, it enabled a number of passions to be brought together at once. I've already uh, explained my passion for slope soaring in general. But when I started as a, as a teenager, I was uh, still very keen to join the Air Force, uh, still madly keen on fast jets and military transport. Uh, and, and for me, it enabled me to bring all that together, combining the slopes, uh, the slope flying uh, passion with, with my love of fast jets and also scale modeling. We have the ability here to uh, you know, put, put your own heart and soul into the model as it's finished and really develop something quite bespoke and, uh, and meaningful to, to the owner and the pilot. So it was a combination of those things, really, which, uh, which thrilled me at the time. I can remember the feeling of going from my middle phase and my phase six to... Uh, to the early PSS models that we'd seen. And uh, as I say, although the flying at times isn't quite as, as good, it's more difficult to operate in certain conditions with a PSS model. Uh, the, the rewards when it all goes well and the, the images that we capture, uh, both with the camera, but also you know, visually whilst flying, it, it's very reminiscent of uh, full-size air shows and, and air displays, which, uh, which is why I do it really. Just a few photos here taken in recent years. I'm just trying to sort of show the sort of dynamics and some of the locations that we fly in. Uh, we do a lot of good work with the camera, uh, capturing some of the magical moments, but uh, you can see some of the images we get very different to flat field flying. We have a much closer proximity to our models on the slope. We have the ability to fly at head height or even sub head height, if you wish, enabling uh, very easy topside photographs and often against superb backdrops, as you can see, particularly with the uh, Mustang shots on the right there which is overlooking Hell's Mouth Bay uh, near Abersock. Again, as a young kid, no money, no car. I was uh, not a lot of money to throw at the hobby at all. It was, it was really the only feasible way of operating a scale jet for me. Uh, I was always put off by uh, some of the kits in the magazines at the time where you were forced to put a massive two-stroke motor in the nose and ruin the lines, or, or maybe it was a, a pusher prop at the back end, again, damaging the... Uh, the original drawings of, of the of the full size. So yes, there were other ways of operating a jet, but uh, this was all day before the days of uh, readily available electric flights and EDF hadn't been invented. Gas turbines were still only some things that were being uh, devised by very clever designers, not not off the shelf. And again, above my uh, above my budget capabilities, of course. So PSS offered that ability to operate uh, fast jets, but also complex multi-engines. In fact, any type of aircraft you could consider would uh, would be possible. Uh, all done in a, a very cost-effective manner using basic materials. Uh, at the time as well, another thing that was exciting about the whole hobby was the amount of new models uh, arriving at the slope. Uh, as we're growing 
uh, there was always at an event there was always a number of brand new models that had never been seen before never seen before operated as a, as a glider so it's very exciting times really and uh, you know great feeling looking back when people are opening the boots of the cars and bringing out their their work from the winter uh, uh, today you know there's not many aircraft types that haven't been tried and tested uh, and the very latest aircraft types in the real world are not lending themselves beautifully for radio control. They need uh, many tens of computers to stay airborne, as, as you know, with the modern aerodynamics. But uh, well, we're still always on the lookout for rare or bespoke aircraft types, uh, perhaps from the past that haven't been done before. We do like uh, the ability to pick a new type. I mentioned this low cost and low complexity. We tend to use either cheap or the traditional materials, also obviously going through the roof at the moment on costs, which is hurting us. But so uh, we use a lot of different materials as well. And, and to develop this uh, practical, we call it standoff scale or slope scale uh, level of modeling. But, uh, you know, regardless of maybe tweaks to uh, things like wingspan and tail area to aid the gliding, we put a lot of work into the finish on the models and we, we do our very best to make sure that they look like the real thing. So scale, scale color schemes, scale, uh, insignia and decals, uh, all, all really important to reproduce that image of the full size uh, when we're flying and, and when we're taking the photos. Two words I often think about when, when I think about PSS as a whole, diversity of models, model types, as we've just discussed, and, and ingenuity as well. Uh, PSS builders have always had a sort of reputation for trying to develop something a little bit different, and, and we all would love a an add-on to the model, whether it's a, a working scale feature like an air brake uh, or, or perhaps flashing lights or afterburners or even sound systems on some of the modern models today. Uh, we, we all love a sort of gimmick or an add-on. So just a couple of slides really, just to show first the range of models that you could expect to see at any event. Uh, and then some of the ingenious ideas that we've seen over the years, just for a bit of fun. So diversity first, just to, again, a range of models. We've we've flown everything from World War World War One biplanes and uh, um, in, intermittent intermediate war biplanes, as shown here. Uh, some of the very few types that we keep the wheels on. Actually, typically our models would not have undercarriage, but obviously biplanes fitted with fixed wheels that has to be there for that scale uh, result as well as we've described. Uh, World War Two types have been done at length. I think uh, I can't picture any any World War Two type that hasn't been done, even down to V1 doodle bugs, uh, it starts to get a little bit crazy, but uh, yeah, well covered at uh, the World War II period. And as I said earlier, we love experimental types and, and one-offs or, or pre-production aircraft uh, as shown there. The, the, the designers love the ability to pick a model that hasn't been seen before and bring something completely new uh, to the slope and to our events. Airliners have proved popular. They've gone through a phase and coming back again, some of the modern airliners like the 787 there, they have beautiful glider, glider like wings lend themselves very nicely to, to our sport. The only downside of airliners uh, with the configuration as the 787 is the, the low uh, underhanging engines, which need to be knocked off on landing to avoid damage to the wing. So uh, we typically fit those on sliding joints with magnets and, and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll remove themselves to the rear safely uh, on touchdown. Uh, some systems allow things like drop tanks to be released in the air on the pass before you do your landing. Uh, but yeah, all types of gliders there from uh, airliners, as you can see there from the 707 right up to the 787. My favourite aspect of the hobby is, is the military, modern military stuff. Uh, so again, all, all types really. Some of the very latest designs, as I've said, difficult to model and, and fly representative of the full size uh, with them being so uh, aerodynamically unstable. But, uh, you know, some of the uh, Cold War models uh, ideally suited and, and certainly jet trainers lend themselves very nicely uh, to, to what we're trying to achieve safely. So, yeah, just a slide on diversity there. Huge range. I could have put a thousand photographs on that slide, uh, but limited, uh, limited with space and time, obviously. And then we move on to ingenuity. So go on, going back in time somewhat. These, uh, these are the guys from Scotland, down from Edinburgh, uh, bringing in with them three new designs, all with uh, swing wing mechanisms that they designed themselves at home. Uh, so F-111, Tornado and Tomcat. And these models were flown, uh, launched with the wing swept forward, as you'd, as you'd expect, but with height uh, and, uh, and a little bit of bravery. The wings were swept back to full sweep. And yes, they'd descend and they'd speed up quickly. They have a bit of fun, maybe a couple of twinkle rolls before getting the wings pushed forward again and uh, getting back out as a glider to recover some height. 
So they, they were brilliant. They, they worked very well. Uh, excellent uh, ingenuity. Pivot wings have been done. This is the uh, NASA AD-1 uh, experimental plane where they were researching uh, the drag effect of a, a pivot wing. Uh, this machine flies beautifully as a glider. I've always been staggered at how well it operates. It's like a phase six with the wing uh, perpendicular to the airflow in, in the normal convention. But you know, Simon sweeps this wing as shown in the top right hand picture to some ridiculous angles and, and it still generates lift uh, with reduced drag. So uh, it's amazing how well that, that operated. And again, quite a, an ingenious bespoke uh, pivot system built inside the fuselage to take the loads uh, of that wing, which must be uh, 65, 70 inch span, I'm guessing. We fitted models with smoke systems and we've tied models together to enable formation flying all from the slope all with various degrees of success admittedly but so great fun nonetheless we've dropped rocket ships off mother ships like the x-15 and the b-52 uh, there's a great element of fun and experimentation in all of this it's all done in a safe manner from remote slopes and uh, we have a, a whale of the time so the x-15 did not fly uh, brilliantly well it was a bit of a lawn dart but uh, great fun nonetheless and models range in scale. These are a couple of scale designs taken from, I think, uh, JetX models, uh, free flight, now converted to two channel radio control slope soarers. So they're some of the smallest models that you might see, all beautifully detailed and finished, as you, as you can see there, uh, right up to the big stuff. So uh, this was a Guinness Book of Records machine designed and built originally by Simon Cocker, still flying today. Uh, that's uh, Antonov 225, uh, 18 foot span, close to 60 pounds all at weight. But again, uh, very simple materials. It's all white foam, veneered white foam. Uh, and the model was lasted, you know, it was probably built late eighties. It's still flying today and uh, still going strong. Amazing really what you can do with a, a huge chunk of foam and, and a couple of sheets of veneer. So I just wanted to take a little bit of time talking about what might make a particularly good PSS model. Uh, as we've demonstrated there, all types of aircraft will fly in the right conditions. But for me, I, I get a little bit frustrated when we travel long distances to go flying and you haven't got the right conditions. The winds can be often a little bit too light for some of our stuff that has very high wing loadings uh, and you have to pick the right model for the right day. So for me, a, a good PSS model should bring with it a good all round handling capability, you should be able to fly in a range of conditions. And there's a few characteristics that might help us along that journey quite simply. So, I mean, ideally you're looking at few aircraft designs with relatively slender low drag fuselages and, and you choose a night you choose a type as well that had adequate wing area to give you a good start uh, again we're trying to maintain a, a level of scale fidelity uh, without grossly increasing wing spans or wing areas in an ideal world the, the type would have an unswept wing as well we can build models with ridiculous sweeps but they don't operate quite as uh, as well all around as uh, as an unswept wing would and of course, you'd have a decent moment arm between wing and tail, and you'd have a representative tail area as well to give us a good chance. So that's that, that's the sort of ingredients that you need for the good all-around handling machine that we're looking for. But of course, what we just described is a sports model, typically. And you know, the phase six shown there, Chris Foss knew exactly what he was doing by the time he got to the sixth uh, rendition of his phase series. Uh, what happens if you need something in your inventory like the Harrier? You know. It's, grossly uh, different in, in, in layout and, and in the design, but still something that people have strived for to fly as a PSS glider from the slope. So let's just look at how that might be done. Obviously some aircraft are more naturally suited than others. So you can pick your type to minimize the amount of work needed to get to the slope with, with your model type. I think that's the key message there. This was a diagram we drew many years ago now. It just helps us sort of generate a rule of thumb and a standard from which you can work from. Obviously no two full-size designs are quite identical, uh, but let's just talk around this, uh, this diagram for a little bit. If you, if you take uh, dimension A, which is the, uh, uh, the core dimension at the wing root, an ideal plan form, you typically have a span of around four to four and a half A, which gives you a nice workable aspect ratio on the wing. Uh, and to enable a decent elevator response and, and nice uh, sedate, characteristics in pitch you'd ideally be looking for a, a moment arm of around one and a half to two a giving that uh, relative distance between the tail plane and the wing and to enable us to balance it without putting a whole host of uh, bricks or lead in the nose 
you'd have a nose length in front of the wing of uh, ideally 1A, maybe three quarters A minimum. Uh, obviously, types vary tremendously. World War One types often have very, very short noses. Modern military stuff often has a very short moment arm between the wing trailing edge and the tailplane leading edge. If you look at the F-35, they almost overlap. So um, go on, it's about picking the type that requires the minimum amount of uh, derivation from the original full-size drawings if you want to make it representative of the full size. That said, you can consider subtle design alterations from the original to improve your chances of a successful gliding machine. Uh, that's what we're trying to strive for. It's about that all round gliding performance whilst retaining that scale aircraft character. Okay, we're trying to trick uh, the viewer, trick the eye into saying that that's modeled as, as the full size was built. Whereas reality, we are making subtle changes to uh, improve our chances with a PSS model. So if we go back to our Harrier, which as I say, is one end of the spectrum of difficulty for PSS. You can see the full size. It has a, a wing shape and a tail shape and a fin shape, all very characteristic. You'd want to represent those curves and make sure that the, the profile is, is accurate inside view. But there are some significant changes ideally required there to make that fly successfully as a PSS model. And, and this, this is an example of a plan that's been around for some time. It was uh, drawn originally by Richard Green uh, so yes, you can see the the wing stretch is there, but the uh, cord has been increased a little bit to to try and mask that. Uh, you'll see that the air intakes are slim somewhat, so they're not as draggy as the full size would be, uh, and they've obviously been uh, flat face blanked off to stop any uh, going through the fuselage uh, with it being a glider. But all the characteristics of the Harrier are there. You know the curves, uh, the shape of the fin, the shape of the uh, uh, cockpit and nose, albeit this is a GR3 in model form, not the Sea Harrier as per the full size, but uh, it's representative of the full size in, in all, uh, all the character. And, and of course, the, the RAF scheme uh, is, is fairly realistic as well in this case. So one, a Harrier nonetheless, albeit uh, quite heavily tweaked from the full size design. We move to the other end of the spectrum. Some designs lend themselves absolutely perfectly to uh, you know, true representative uh, of the full-size aircraft. This is uh, an Avro Vulcan B2 built by uh, Matt Jones, built from the plans from the South Hearts Models uh, Company, which if I understand correctly, the, the model drawings were taken from the AV row drawings of the full size. Uh, so I don't think you'll see a more true representation of the Vulcan uh, in model form than, than this particular plan. 72-inch uh, span, weighs about nine pounds, flies admirably as a PSS glider in a, in a wide range of conditions. And it's totally realistic in, in flight. You know, it's very difficult to say that's not a real, real Vulcan in, in operation, albeit flying low over land in that, in that particular view. <laughs> so go on, just a few more guidelines for anyone who's thinking of perhaps sketching a, a PSS model for themselves and having a crack. Um, I think one of the most important things for me is that this, the uh, side elevation, uh, the fuselage profile should be as true scale as possible. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at our models in that orientation. Uh, and uh, that's the typical view that we'll see in, in the photography. So I think that's really important uh, to get that as true scale as possible. There are certain examples where you might want to deviate or need to deviate. If, if you were building a type that had a very short nose, for example, you might need to stretch uh, lengthen the nose a little bit to a balance. Equally, if the type had a very small fin area, uh, you might think for lateral stability, you might just need to tweak the area of the fin. But do that subtly and, and in a manner that uh, uh, it's not it's not too obvious. Wing area is a little easier to get away with, particularly if, if you increase the span and the cord with similar proportions. Amazing how effective that is. If you increase the span only, and leave the cord scale, uh, you change the aspect ratio of the wing and the eye is very acute at picking that up, particularly if it's an aircraft type that's well known and loved, let's say like the Spitfire. Uh, you know, everyone in the UK would know that the wing shape was not right. If you increase the span and the cord and keep that elliptical shape as originally drawn, uh, you can get away with quite a big increase on area without anyone even knowing it's been altered. So that's, uh, that's a trick of the trade there to uh, maximize scale look. And when you're viewing the aircraft in plan view, when it's at height, if you increase the size of the wing, but you don't increase the size of the tail proportionally, the aircraft looks odd as well. So th there's a rule of thumb uh, 
uh, you would in, you would change the size of the tailplane in proportion to your tweak on the wing, uh, just to keep that plan form as representative and as full size as possible. A type considered wing section is key. Uh, what do I mean by type considered? We have a, a range of aerofoils available to utilize. Some of them really high performing, some of them quite poorly performing, but that again aids us perhaps in flying these models uh, as per the full size, we're, we're trying to replicate the full size machine. So I don't want to see a Spitfire doing 500 miles an hour in, in a flat pass. It, it should be slowed up and flown like the full size really uh, to maximize. So we, we can choose wing sections, thickened wing sections, uh, like Clark Y or Epler 205, for example, which uh, you know bring the, bring the relative speeds down, but also give us good lifting section and still retain that good all round capability. Uh, if you are designing an aircraft, let's say like an F-111, which has a very uh, draggy fuselage with big air intakes, uh, but you want the model to fly fast like the jet uh, would do in full in real life, uh, then you can choose uh, high performance, uh, slippier sections like RG-15, for example. So it's horses for courses. Nice to have a bit of considered thought as to what wing section you're doing, thinking about how the aircraft should be operated uh, and to try and maximize that scale realism in, in flight. Uh, of course, there are thousands of Air Force sections that could be chosen that you, you tend to go with the devil, you know, and, uh, you know, there's probably only a list of six or seven Air Force sections that I would ever consider personally uh, because I've not tried anything else. We showed on the Harry the minimization of draggy features like air intakes, but it's important to not omit them. You do see some uh, slope scale PSS models without air intakes at all, Hawks without air intakes. For me, that's not really a hawk uh, as a scale, a scale fan, but uh, no harm in uh, perhaps slightly reducing the cross-sectional area. Uh, it's about retaining the character of the original, so it has to have the feature there for me, uh, albeit at a slightly reduced scale. And finally, the, the, the level of finish, the standoff level of finish. We used to have a circle where we do scale competitions and you put your model inside a maybe a 12 foot diameter circle and the, the aircraft would be judged for scale realism from the outside of that circle. Uh, so we're not, we're not scrutinizing aircraft like might be done at the World Jet Masters, uh, looking at rivets, but uh, we wanna see accuracy in, in, a, in a paint scheme, accurate colors, accurate decals, and, and just to bring out the character of the full size type that you've taken the time to model. So we do pride ourselves on that, albeit to a level of detail, which uh, is fit for purpose at, at, uh, at 12 foot. Just some other design considerations. We've, we've talked about not having undercarriage on the majority of these models. We do operate from some pretty remote places and it's very rare that you land in a field that doesn't have either coarse bracken or rocks or uh, sunbaked cow pats. There's, there's all sorts of hazards uh, in the fields we operate from. So the models need to be built to a level of robustness to enable them to be fit for purpose in, uh, in everyday use. That means no open structures generally. Uh, even if you were to build a wing up uh, traditionally, you would want to see at least on the underside of the wing uh, a full skin of balsa to uh, avoid damage to covering materials. Uh, and we have a range of options available. We'll come on to some material options in a little while, but uh, it needs to be robust. The, the models get quite a hard life on the slope and they do take quite a bit of maintenance to keep them looking pretty uh, for any length of time. The ethos behind our sport here, we do enjoy using quite low cost, low tech, low complexity structures, uh, as we'll come on to in the next slide, I think. So the overall philosophy is we're trying to build scale models in a robust manner, but with a weight consideration to enable good gliding capabilities. Uh, as we said, that, that a lot of the, lots of the models that we build and fly, they're conventionally built uh, with balsa and light ply structures. Uh, but there are other options. Veneered white foam lends itself beautifully to the sport. You can cut it easily with a hot wire and uh, veneer that, uh, certainly externally. Some models are veneered inside and out, actually, for additional strength. This material is pretty bulletproof and lasts a long, long time. It's also very easy to repair if you do suffer damage. Uh, just by cutting out chunks and replacing it quite quickly. Uh, and, and there's models flying today on our circuit that have been built 30, 35 years ago and still going strong. Uh, so it's white polystyrene, 
with uh, a copy dex veneer and it lasts forever. It's amazing. Uh, there are other foam alternatives as well. We've recently held a 48 hour build challenge where we uh, hand carve models ourselves out of high density blue or pink foam and then covered those with glass once they were shaped. Uh, they're a bit toy-like in, in uh, comparison to some of the models you've seen already, but quite effective and, and very quick method of uh, generating small-scale two-channel PSS models. The glass just gives you a surface which gives you an eggshell finish uh, and some uh, possibility of long life on the slope. But perhaps more importantly, it gives you a surface onto which you can uh, paint and, and, and add a scale finish to the model. EPP was uh, something that came around perhaps 15 15 years ago first, it, it, it suddenly got very expensive when we, the car industry started using it to fill uh, door panels and, uh, and dashboards uh, in, in car industry. But an EPP model, again, sanded or shaped uh, and then covered in brown paper is, is bulletproof. Uh, we've got models with long lives, again, still operated today. Uh, they can be treated pretty badly and survive, uh, survive incidents with heavy landings, for example, that would uh, destroy a conventionally built model for sure. Uh, if you cover the EPP in brown paper, again, it gives you a surface which uh, is, is uh, in tune with what we're trying to achieve. You can't tell it's a foamy at all, and it also gives you a good robust surface onto which you can add paint and, and surface detail. Finally, lost foam fiberglass structures is something, particularly for fuselages, something that a number of our guys uh, have learned and, and have employed successfully. So this is where they would uh, hand carve and shape a fuselage out of solid foam. Uh, you would wrap that finished structure in uh, glossy parcel tape and then you would fiberglass onto the outside of the parcel tape and then the horrible bit is you hold it vertically and you pour petrol uh, down the down the fuselage to leach out all the foam uh, do it outside in the garden is my recommendation and then you pull out all the tape and you're left with a fiberglass fuselage uh, which is quite fit for purpose a good lightweight way of producing quite complex shapes just a couple of examples. We'll start with a traditional built up. Uh, this is an SU27 flanker. So again, perhaps a type that you wouldn't really expect to see on the slope. It's uh, quite an aggressive uh, modern fighter jet. You can see the, the construction in the wing is, is quite traditional. Just a few ribs, lightweight, uh, leading edge, trailing edge, and some uh, hardwood spars, all at uh, considered scale. The real strength in the structure comes in the top skins, which will only be 1 16th balsa. But once it's skin top and bottom, you get quite a strong structure there, albeit lightweight. It's got the strength where it's needed. You can see the entire airframe is, is, is skinned in balsa, uh, giving you the option whether you would want to glass at this point. Uh, but this model is relatively small. I think it, it, this particular one was finished in film and then it was, uh, it was etched and painted to give the finished result as shown there. Uh, so yeah, beautiful, uh, beautiful example of quite a complex shaped, traditionally built model. The other example I'll show is EPP because this was quite revolutionary at the time. This was a model I built many years ago now, uh, Sea Fury. We built the fuselage in two halves uh, to enable us to hollow out the, uh, the fuselage rear of the wing. Once it was all stuck together and shaped, it looked like a massive uh, foam baseball bat for a while. But there is a Sea Fury in there somewhere. Uh, Getting a bit closer here, you can see it, a lot of filler is used. We've just dropped snakes into the surface of the foam. It's quite, uh, as a traditional builder, it's, it's, it doesn't feel like you're doing a nice job really at this stage at all. But once it's all covered in brown paper and PVA and you let that go hard and dry off nicely, you, you immediately end up with quite a solid looking beast. And it's, it's one that feels a lot more uh, traditional, if you will. It's, 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 it's very versatile and solid and takes paint nicely and quite quickly end up with a, with a decent finish on a model that should last forever. It's pretty bulletproof. Uh, I tend to pull the wing root, the wing bolt out, but that's about all. I've not damaged it in many years flying. Okay, so I hope that gives a feel for the types of thoughts that you might have as a, as a builder or as a designer of PSS models. There is quite a bit to, to consider to get that all around, uh, all around model. Uh, performing as you'd want it to do. I just wanted to spend a few moments talking a little bit more about the history of the PSSA. Uh, as we said earlier, the Cluid Club was running dedicated PSS events from 1983. Uh, they proved quite popular. This was very new at the time. I guess a very small percentage of the population knew anything about PSS. Uh, the first event was run uh, 
at Mulvama, and it was won uh, by uh, Graham Adkar, I believe. This is his uh, MB339. Majority of this was all foam construction. Again, it was later kitted with the fiberglass fuselage uh, through Ashford models and then uh, and then Dragon models with Ray Jones with the fiberglass setup. And there's still examples of that type flying today. Uh, but this is a bespoke home build all in foam and veneer. The success of the Clue events, uh, they ran for a number of years. It, it, it led to other events being run at other slopes where people had seen PSS and had a go at PSS. So there, there was a, a regular annual event at Leek and Moorlands. Uh, although the slope there is not perhaps ideally suited for PSS, it's not quite uh, aggressive enough for a drop. Uh, North Yorkshire Moors held good events at the whole of Hawkham for many years, and we, we still fly occasionally up there with the guys at that club. Uh, and although it's not a club based at, at the Great Swarm, Landudno uh, became a chosen site for events to be run, and, and we still uh, we look at that as our home really today. Uh, most of our events are held up on the Great Swarm uh, for the reasons that we can set a date and that the, the hill flies the majority of the wind directions around the compass. Uh, so it, as an event organiser, it really helps mitigate any risk of cancellation. But yeah, great coastal slopes. Uh, we do prefer flying from the coastal slopes because the types of models we're operating, they need a uh, good clean lift. Uh, they don't really get going in mushy air. So, uh, you know, 15 mile an hour lift on the Great Orm is uh, much uh, more much more strength in that than you'd experience 15 miles an hour at Leek and Moorlands, for example. And the models are revolutionized because of that clean lift. Uh, so we tend to go to the coastal slopes where the lift is, is best. So you can see there was a need to try and pull together all these geographically dispersed developments. There was people all over the UK, up in Scotland, uh, working new ideas, new methods of construction. Uh, some successfully, some not. And the guys were only meeting really when we held an event. Uh, so there needed to be some way of sharing developments, keeping everyone informed of what we were doing. Uh, and as well as providing uh, reports from uh, events that had taken place and also setting dates for events in the future. Alan Hume came up with the idea of uh, establishing an association and generating what at the time was just perhaps a, a 10 page newsletter quarterly. Uh, and then distributed around that, uh, that small membership. Some of the members, uh, those founder members are still with us today and still flying with us today, which is which is great. You can see that there'll always be a passion for power scale soaring once you've started. I think that's quite evident. So where are we today? We no longer produce a, a newsletter these days. We're a fully web-based uh, association and we're using all the latest uh, media to coordinate our activities. Uh, we do our very best to promote PSS flying in the UK and across uh, the globe, really. We have quite good relationships with other uh, clubs and associations who fly PSS models, uh, particularly across mainland Europe, but also in the States and in Australia, where PSS is still uh, very popular. Uh, we've got a website, as we've said, uh, that has a dedicated members area where we can uh, chat and play. Uh, but there's all a whole, huge uh, list of history on the website covering uh, our activities right back to uh, to the mid 80s. Uh, so we've, we've pulled information from the newsletters and make sure that all the history is captured on the website. But it's also a great place to share new models, uh, advertise models for sale. It's, it's quite a vibrant uh, a site. We can also offer plans through the plan service there. We don't own all the plan rights ourselves, but we do a number of them and we can sell those through the website. You can uh, purchase those in paper or PDF format if you want to go at building a model. But there's links there also to other manufacturers who either produce plans uh, or short kits which are applicable to PSS activity. Just trying to do everything we can to promote the sport and get as many people looking at, at it as possible. And we do uh, have quite a good footprint in the magazine, I'm glad to say. We, we have had flyers that have written uh, columns in the past for the mags, but uh, I, I think it's a reflection on the dynamic aspects of what we do and some of the photography that we achieve uh, we, we do uh, get asked quite a bit to put uh, reports in the magazines. You can also see we've got build blogs there when we've had mass build events and we've kitted some of our models and tried to get people around the globe building at the same time. We've even achieved a couple of cover shots, which was a bit of a coup for us this last couple of years, seeing a PSS model on the front of uh, Prime magazine like rcm &E. and other mags around the globe also uh, you know, want to see what we're doing and, and ask us to write articles, which is great. Uh, 
and it's generated a lot of good discussion uh, about how we're doing it and what we're doing. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have that footprint in the magazine and, and spread the word that way. There's around 350 members now. You, uh, recall we had only 20 on that first newsletter. Uh, so we're not a massive association by any means, but uh, we are truly global. There's, there's members uh, across Europe, in the States, Australia, New Zealand, and even Japan. And when we've run mass build uh, events uh, with some of the models we've drawn and designed ourselves, uh, we've got models being built in all of these areas. They're with us in, in spirit, although not flying with us at the events, which is great to see. And, you know, with media, social media and the website, we're able to talk and discuss ideas and share ideas uh, live effectively, which uh, which has really revolutionised the way we're working together. And we've been web-based for some time. The website's had a big uplift in this last few years, but uh, we've been based on the web since 2003. The, the, the magazines or the, the newsletters we were producing were getting very expensive uh, and, and uh, we were a bit behind the times uh, not reliant on social media and, and the and the uh, and the World Wide Web, so we're, we're fully uh, up with the times now, and I think we're much better operated uh, managing the way we do because we got rid of the cost of the newsletters. We're able to offer a free membership. Uh, there's no annual fee. We do occasionally have a, a small cost to enter competitions for prizes, but uh, it's generally free membership, which is great, and uh, we can continue to operate like that. This is a list of events that we have this year. So we've run two events already. Uh, we're operating from uh, four well-proven sites in the UK. Majority of them are coastal sites for the benefits of the lift, as, as, as I've explained. But two of these sites, we've just come back from the bulk in South Wales, inland slopes, huge, uh, huge hills uh, with massive amount of lift available, lend themselves very well uh, to PSS flying. Uh, the landing can be difficult at some of these sites. The other inland site there is uh, the White Horse in Wiltshire which are very common, a very popular gliding site and one that we attended for the first time as an association last year. So looking forward to getting back there later in September. Because there's generally a huge amount of travel needed by at least a proportion of our flyers, uh, we, we only tend to run events, planned events, April to October during British summertime hours uh, to maximise the time of day. And then we also run two-day events to try and mitigate the weather as well it's quite often that you'll have one day that's perfectly suited to flying and one day that's perfectly not suited to flying uh, that happens more than you'd, you'd bet uh, so yeah the, the weekend events we try and make a weekend of it regardless of the weather we'll bring models to suit all conditions including electric flight where where there's no wind uh, but yeah the two-day event is uh, quite a robust way of doing business and making sure that at least we get some flying having traveled just wanted to spend a couple of minutes just perhaps describing a typical event uh, just to sort of paint the picture as to what we do and how we operate. Uh, as I say, two day event to mitigate the weather risk. Uh, we're all traveling long distances generally uh, towards the coast. The, the coastal sites are preferred, as, as we've said. Uh, we're tending to get around 25 to 30 pilots. That's a good event these days, which, which is great to see. Uh, there has been times where we've, we've had a lot less than that. Uh, and we've had to consider trying to generate recruitment and, and, and newcomers, which is where the mass build ideas came from, perhaps in 2014. But at the moment, we're really healthy, great turnout, and uh, we tend to start uh, flying around 10.30 after a, a safety brief. Uh, you can see there's still a pegboard there in the bottom left-hand corner. Some of these models have had long lives and are still operating on 35. The majority of models, certainly any new build, they're all 2.4. Uh, as you'd expect, but yeah, we still cater for the pegboard uh, and, and operate in a safe manner. Uh, the picture in the top right, I just want to try and try and relay what a sort of friendly and helpful atmosphere that we operate in. So, you know, that's a picture of uh, Andy Mead as a pilot at the nose end of that big typhoon there, being helped uh, back to the pits, having landed by three other pilots. They're not rig, they're not rig guys. They're, uh, they're they're pilots as well. They're just waiting their turn to fly. But everyone pitches in and helps out. The bigger models in particular, when we're flying in windy conditions, they can be quite hard to manage individually. Uh, and we need guys, at least on the wingtips, to move around. Uh, but yeah, rigging and carrying models, everyone's uh, willing to help out and do their bit. It, it's a real uh, friendly atmosphere and everyone's uh, helpful, always willing to help, which is great. Uh, 
picture at the bottom in the middle shows me handing a prize to, to Matt Jones going back a couple of years. We do occasionally have competitive, competitive elements to our meets. I think the sweet spot that everyone likes the fly for fun feel. Uh, where there's uh, other than a few site rules, site specific safety rules, there's, there's really no uh, competitive element and people can fly as and when they wish. Uh, we tend to set a limit to the number of planes in the air at any once, uh, any one point in time, just to avoid the risk of midair. Some of these models have got many hundreds of hours of work in them and uh, crashing them together unnecessarily is uh, not, not ideal. So we, we broke that rule this weekend uh, at the bulk when we were trying to do our mass uh, mass launch and mass fly for the record attempt uh, and uh, we launched 12 models uh, on the Saturday but uh, I'm afraid we did have one midair before mid midday so uh, we only registered 10 uh, at the stroke of noon but yeah the PSSA I was glad to say were able to do their bit as part of the uh, centenary event uh, this weekend which was good and you can see bottom right we fly uh, right to the end of the day really uh, we're only getting together as a group perhaps six or seven times a year so we do try and make the very most of the weekend we'll typically have a uh, a meal as a group on the saturday night but if the weather's still good on the sunday evening we fly till dark and you can see there that uh, beautiful picture of the magister uh, being launched in a golden hour last couple of hours of sunlight from the great Orm. and bob jennings who owns and operates that model he flew till dark really there you can see it's uh, passing the moon with the nose light all lit up so uh, we do try and maximize the use of our weekends uh, once we've made the effort to get up there with all our kit uh, very enjoyable weekend i think everyone we a great great bunch of guys and girls and uh, we're, we're all very social and friendly so please do come and join us even if you don't have a pss model please uh, bring a slate model to come and join us and and take part in the fun okay phil we've got some questions that we probably should answer before people um, yeah okay good question from chris bad bradbury how critical is the model's weight is making the model as light as possible a good idea or does that in reduce an ability to penetrate the wind when he goes slope sore and he adds ballast for a windy day quite normal yes. would the same apply to pss yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's very easy to build them too light, actually. Uh, if you want the if you want the model to operate in a true scale manner, you know, being able to do perhaps climbing turns and chandelles, it needs to have a certain amount of energy to replicate the full size. Otherwise, it it just doesn't climb up the hill as you'd want it to. Uh, so yeah, we, we I think uh, smaller models you'd be more conscious of weight, and and if you have a perhaps if your local hill isn't. Uh, particularly steep or particularly uh, energetic when when the wind's blowing uh, you might tailor your model to your local slope but when we're flying on some of these big cliffs uh, the coast we're not too weight conscious uh, it, I, I think the lighter you build they very easily uh, get blown about and, and don't look like the full size when when they're not operated as such so yeah I wouldn't be too conscious of weight just even if you were to build a small model heavy it would still fly well on the right day you just wouldn't be able to fly it every weekend that's all yeah okay so um peter cox had a question do do you always hand launch or do you use bungees at all uh no we, we always hand launch uh, even the big stuff like the antonov uh, yeah. the, the 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 uh the surface of the ground we tend to fly on it, it would not be suitable for bungee uh so, so uh, we, you can't do any sort of bungee off the ground anyway. I guess you could do a bungee from a hand launch if the uh, if the lift was too light for sustained flight. Uh, but uh, yeah. so yeah, you, you could use a bungee if you were to hold the model as a, as a hand launch still. But uh, it's not it's not utilised at all really. No. Do do any of your guys use any of the small EPP ducted fan models with the fan units taken out? Uh, yes, absolutely. There's a short section at the end of the pack actually that shows a quick, uh, quick way to get into PSS, and and you know we're we're spoiled for choice really with ARTF models which are easily converted to PSS, uh, particularly if it was a propeller driven model. Uh, you can fit a folding prop and a brake on the speed controller and and leave it as a as a powered model. We call them EPSS. Quite a, a durable. Uh, approach really because you can fly in all conditions or any locations the, the edf you would have to 
the, the fan would probably be a bit draggy, so I wouldn't want to leave the EDF fan in really. Uh, no. Better to take it out and perhaps even block the air intakes off and, and stop the air going through the fuselage, unless it was a massive model. You may just have okay. helped one of our um, YouTube viewers, a uh, chap called Skin at FPV, who's uh, a friend's given him an FMS T28 uh, Trojan, I think they are, aren't they? Yeah. To saw, but he's no experience. So he set it up with retracts and motor, but he's thinking of removing those to get a saw in. Have you any advice for him? Yeah, I think the plan form of that, I'm fairly familiar with that design. I think uh, it stands a very good chance of having a successful slope saw there, no problem. Uh, unless you have the ability to land on a prepared surface, I would I would take the retracts out and reduce a bit of weight, personally. Uh, put, perhaps put them in another model. The, the retracts will do, no, certainly on the slopes we fly, the, the retracts would serve no purpose at all. Would you leave the motor in then and just put a folding propeller on it? Although it's quite a wide front, hasn't it? Yeah, the folding prop might not work on that design. It's Working quite a, a fat fuselage, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and if uh, if you can break the prop and, and keep it still, uh, then that's okay as well. It just looks uh, looks horrible. <laughs> if you if you allow the propeller to free wheel, I'm afraid it acts as a massive brake and, and it will affect the way the, the aircraft glides. So right. it's important to get it braked and stopped. Uh, and ideally folded back just to just to improve the looks of the model really yeah okay that's i'm sure it'll be appreciative of that he does have one one other question he says are a lot of the plans available online for the models yeah the the, the website uh if we, if we don't own the plan rights ourselves in the pssa uh there's a number of links on the pssa website which will take you to companies like saric who uh have a, have a whole host of uh license plan sales and, and it'll take you to their website where you can buy the plans but yeah the, there must be uh, i guess close to 80 or 90 different plans available through the pssa website thank you for, i've just put the link onto the youtube chat for for him so he can have a good poke around okay phil i think we um answered all those questions so maybe okay pick up your presentation okay. yeah go on we're just, just building on the back of our events really i just wanted to show a couple of photos showing some of the picturesque areas that we fly in so this is uh, hell's mouth uh, near abasok uh, and again you can see the relationship between the, the model and the pilot we can fly at head height or just below head height and get some superb photographs with the uh, with the backdrops making it uh, stunning really you know we, we, we fly in some wonderful places uh, this again is at the Klim Peninsula. This is at Kim Farm. You see a T33 in the backdrop there, but we're having to launch here over that small fence, but we land in the field where we're stood. Uh, if the model, if we did lose our lift, for example, and you did go down, that you, you have to land on the beach below, or if you couldn't get over that fence. But you know, the the, the standard way of operating is to get enough height, come round to a circuit, and land around the back into wind as you would normally do. A uh, final one, mate, one of my favourites. Uh, these are the EPP T33s being flown at Land Dudno at the Great Orb, uh, whistling down that uh, southwest face there and uh, doing a bit of tail chasing at the end of, a, of another good weekend. Lots of good memories. Yeah, really nice photo that is. I, I just wanted to talk briefly about some spin offs and additions, uh, add ons to PSS flying. The first one we've touched on already about durable models. EPSS, uh, we, we called it at the time, but really now it's just electric models that are flown as PSS models in glider format. It's going back, I can't believe it, over 20 years, but when we suffered foot and mouth disease in the UK, all of our usual flying sites for quite a length of time were off limits. We weren't able to go out and, and enjoy ourselves as we had been doing. And that frustrated a lot of uh, people, uh, as I recall, for a long time. And it, it led to uh, development of this EP. SS concept, uh, models that were, again, it was pretty re readily available ARTF, I guess, uh, at a decent cost at least. So it led to the development of PSS models fitted with electric powertrains and generating this dual purpose all round capability, uh, which proved highly successful. Uh, obviously, if you were flying at the slope, you could fly regardless of wind speed if it was at a site where electric power was allowed. Some of our sites, we, we don't allow electric power at all for noise consideration. Uh, but it gives you this uh, robust capability in a single model. And of course, it means you don't also have to fly. You don't have to travel to the slope. You can fly from the park outside your house 
with the same model. So get more use out of your PSS models because some of my models only fly once or twice each year. You know, you've got to be in the right place with the right model at the right time. Uh, and quite often, this weekend included, I took models to South Wales and they didn't come out of the boot because the conditions weren't right for that model. So just a couple of examples of the uh, sort of handcrafted conversions here. The one on the right in particular, Ferry Barracuda, designed by uh, Steve Griffiths. Uh, not that folding prop, in interestingly. I, I would have expected to see the folders there. But, and the Mosquito on the left uh, is, uh, is a conversion from a PAF electric kit. Uh, but again, flown with the powertrains in as a glider when, when there's lift available. Uh, and if uh, for any reason the lift dies, then you've got electric power to either recover and come home safe or, or you can fly flat field with these models uh, as and when you wish. PSS models can also be aerato from the flat field. Uh, it, it, best to uh, do it with some of the bigger model designs, maybe. You just have to fit a simple nose release unit, as you'd see in any quarter scale or third scale glass ship, uh, best done from the uh, build concept time frame with it stop you having to cut into your fuselage. Uh, but yeah, quite effective, quite good fun. Uh, we actually, as a recruitment drive going back to 2004, 2005, we actually staged some Aerito demonstrations at, at some of the shows like Woodvale and Woodspring Wings, uh, which was a first for us as a, as a group. Uh, and so we enjoyed flying in front of some of the crowds there. And there's just a few pictures to follow of, of one of our days out at Woodspring Wings flying the Antonov. You do get very limited flight times compared to some of the other gliders that might be being towed up, which is a bit embarrassing as a, as a pilot, I guess. But, uh, you know, you, you're safe in the knowledge you're flying a, a quite a different bespoke machine. Uh, the high wing loadings and the drag of typical PSS models means you don't stooge around and float around in thermals like... Uh, like some of the other models would do. But great fun nonetheless, particularly the tow phase and, and the ability to land these scale models in a realistic manner on a nicely prepared strip, or even better, Woodvale, we were landing on the uh, Royal Air Force's runway there, which was, which was really cool. So just a few photos. As I say, these go back to uh, 2005 from memory when this was the second time we displayed at uh, Woodspring Wings. So you can see we put on a good spread of big models uh, to impress the crowds in the static. Uh, and the Antonov was the showpiece in the middle there. That's uh, 18 foot span, as we said earlier. But we flew uh, the B-52, the Antonov and the Canberra from Aerito that weekend. It's myself and Simon Cocker, I think, uh, just getting ready a few pictures before we flew. Uh, and Simon is the designer of this model and the builder of this model many years ago. Uh, it had had a sort of midlife upgrade to get ready for the uh, Aerito events because it had been uh, left, left a dormant in a shed for a number of years. So it needed a bit of a tidy up. You can see the wheels here. That's actually a dolly, uh, a radio control steerable dolly, uh, which enables us to take off from the flat field and the aircraft will lift off. Uh, and the wires that enable the steerable nose wheel just pull out as the aircraft lifts, you'll see that in a minute. Carrying the big lump of foam out to the flight line, which is the amusement of the crowd. And here we are just preparing to, to take off on this fantastic model runway. We've got a third scale Piper Pawnee at the top there to just about ready to take the weight. I'd say it's about a 50, 55 pound model, depending on the, the conditions. Uh, and the chap there just making sure the nose line is attached and all the tensions are good before we, uh, before we give it the beans. Good takeoff straight down the middle. You can see the dolly rolling away there to the left. So that's disconnected now and is just a freewheeling go-kart. But we're away trying to clear those trees with any luck. <laughs> this, this pitch has always interested me. A, a normal conventional glider when on tow would be at least as high as the tow plane, probably higher. But the, uh, the drag, the parasitic drag and the weight of the Antonov, uh, it never gets higher than the tow plane. So the Piper Pawnee's got to work pretty hard uh, to get us up to altitude. Uh, but it, it, it was good for that. We did that and uh, we released and you get to fly around a few times. Compared to normal PSS flying, Aerito, you spend most of your time a long, long way away, which I don't find that enjoyable, really, just looking at it a thousand feet high. But... There's a couple of circuits in it where you're close enough to the crowd to see the aircraft proper up close. This was, I think, the final pass before uh, downwind circuit to land. 
and then landing at Woodspin Wings. It's uh, it's an aircraft carrier, effectively surrounded by marshes, isn't it? So uh, I was glad to get the uh, the glider in in one piece and not not find the water. Dynamic soaring is another part of slope soaring, uh, which I'm sure you've probably had talks on. I won't try and teach anybody uh, the, the, the physics behind dynamic soaring, but we have flown uh, power scale soars in, in this uh, arena as well with some success. Uh, the speeds are nothing like uh, what you'd expect with a, a tailored model, uh, but uh, great fun nonetheless. And, and you know, having flown PSS for many years, the first time I tried PSDS, we called it, the, the model feels different again. It feels supercharged. And although the speeds are ridiculously low compared to the, I think the world record dynamic soar is 548 miles per hour at the moment, which uh, can only be done with uh, super rigid purpose-built, you know, composite machines. Uh, these PSS models aren't designed for anything like that, but flying at 120 miles an hour with the PSS air Mac as shown here, it feels completely different. It feels supercharged. And uh, for me personally, you know, seeing, my, seeing the model come up the hillside like that in that bottom picture, it reminded me again very much of the full-size McKinley loop shots that we, we enjoy taking still. And, and it just made me a school kid again, you know, thinking of the jets coming through the valleys. It was great to see our models uh, flying and being flown like that. So yes, the relative speeds uh, are low and I'm not trying to break any world records with 120 miles an hour, but a completely different way of operating your model. Uh, and the low level aspect to it and the ability to fly up that side of the, the, the dark side of the ridge, as it's called, at low level was, uh, was really quite exciting. We talked about ARTF conversion being perhaps the quickest way into PSS if you're uh, unable or not, uh, not willing to build from a plan or, or convert from a kit. Both of those routes are, are, are possible as well, of course. Uh, Traditionally, that's the way, you know, the majority of our models that we see on the slope, they are plan built, at least. Many of them are designed by the individual as well as plan built. Uh, but yeah, conversion of power kits is one way. But the ARTF market, as it is these days, there's a wealth of opportunity and ideally suited models, particularly models that are designed for electric powertrains where weight is, is so critical uh, for, for good performance. Uh, so yeah, electric warbirds and EDF jets, they all lend themselves beautifully uh, to quick PSS conversion. You just need to consider this list of changes really, and it's nothing too difficult at all. The wheels are no good to any anyone on the slope. So either take them out and put them in another model uh, and, and just fill the cavities with, with balsa or foam, uh, or, or certainly keep them retracted. They'll, they'll just break very easily on the slope. Perhaps consider glass reinforcements of any foam or lightly built airframes, particularly on the underside where the aircraft's due to touch down on, on, the, uh, on the ground. Uh, but yeah, handling models in high winds as well. We tend, to, we tend to have to squeeze our models quite hard at times to get them to the slope in a 40 or 50 mile an hour wind. Uh, and you'll end up putting your fingers through a foam model if it doesn't have any uh, surface capability. So yeah, consider glass reinforcement. Having put the glass on as well, you can of course put a scale paint scheme on top of the glass and make it a bespoke model, which is uh, really what we're all about. You might also want to fit uh, slightly more powerful servos than, than provided in an ARTF model, which tend to be cheap and nasty and not really capable of uh, any load. Uh, particularly so if the uh, control arms are sticking out externally on the underside, which you commonly see on ailerons. Uh, they, they won't last five minutes on the slope. So you might want to just uh, increase the spec on your servos and also increase the throws on your primary controls as well because the, the gliders don't operate at the same airspeeds. Uh, so for the same roll rate, for example, you might need a little bit more throw uh, to, get, to get the roll over the top. And as we've said, you, you've got the option, you can leave the powertrain in to give you that all-round durability uh, or you can take the powertrain out and, uh, and just fly it as a pure PSS model. Both work, uh, but uh, that's just completely up to the up to the builder. Just a few examples over the few last few years. This was uh, an Overlander Takano which I built. I, I, I stripped off the covering as supplied and finished it in the uh, RAF display scheme from years gone by. You can see there that's still got a folded prop. Looks great in black because it masks 
beautifully but uh, yeah there is a propeller there so i've got electric power if needed you can see also the control arms sticking out of the bottom as per the uh, original design uh, which isn't brilliant I, I, quite common we stick them coming out the top surface of the wing to avoid the uh, the damage on landing doesn't quite look as good in the photos but uh, fit for fit for purpose this was a little foam hunter uh, just trying to remember the uh, the manufacturer's name of this i think it was probably rc land it was an edf design all foam relatively small design but uh, yeah the, the conversion for this we we took the edf unit out and we stopped the air going through the fuselage and the intakes in the leading edge of the wing just by blanking those off and painting the intakes black uh, there's two trains of thought as to whether it's better to let the air go through the fuselage or not. I think as the aircraft get bigger, there is a point where it's the right thing to do, allow the air to go through either the fuselage or the nacelle. But this sort of size, this was only about 35 inch span from memory, uh, better to blank off the air intakes and stop the air going through the fuselage and wetting all that interior surface, uh, which would, uh, would be parasitic on drag. So yeah, that flew really well. Uh, for a, a, a relatively cheap phone model straight out of the box. You might all recognize this. This is a Ritmax Spitfire. They, they did a Spitfire and an ME109. Both of them fly beautifully from the slope straight out of the box again. Uh, you can see this has still got the powertrain fitted and uh, a folding propeller there. Tim's just about to launch that off the Great Orm. They fly beautifully as gliders and, and they've got the best ground effect I've ever seen, I think, in a model airplane. They just float on and on as you're bringing them into land. It's just, just amazing. Something a little bit different. This was uh, a uh, Tiger Cat built from the air and auto electric kit. Uh, the powertrains were taken out in this instance. So if you were to look around the front a little more, there's no spinners at all on this design. It's just flat face radials, uh, radial dummies. But yeah, really good design for slope, a good wing area, nice slender fuselage, even though there's the two nacelles uh, adding drag uh, it, it didn't show any any concern about that at all flew brilliantly as a glider again straight out of the box just don't put your electric motors in and add a bit of weight in the nose to compensate and, and you're away with a with a corrected cfg last topic i want to touch on we've mentioned it already regarding recruitment campaigns uh, 2014 we ran our first mass build and we utilized a, a kit which had already been short kitted by Traplet. Andy Blackburn used to be a PSSA member and designed this beautiful little jet provost. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we pulled some ideas together having a mass build in 2014. Uh, I think there was probably three main purposes behind that. Uh, the first really to, to aid recruitment and get more people looking at PSS and taking part in PSS. Also really to rekindle and encourage the development of some of the skills needed to put together a a very traditional balsa and ply model such as this uh, and we chose this model because it was about the right size and the right cost and the right ease of transportation to to suit mass market uh, and we sold probably over 60 or 70 of these models from memory uh, this was the uh, event on the day in june 2014 when we all came together uh, what these have also done is develop a level of uh, improvement in, in the way we finish our models. Uh, and each time we run a mass build, you just see another step change in scale fidelity, whether it's people learning how to put glass cloth onto models, people learning how to airbrush models, people learning how to weather models with airbrush. And, and you know, we just keep going, keep pushing the bar higher and higher on scale finish, which uh, always makes me smile. It always makes me very happy to see. So yeah, check promised in 2014. Uh, slight change in 2016. This was a model that we designed ourselves with the A4 Skyhawk. Uh, we had it kitted again through Traplet uh, to enable us to market it better. And again, they went all over the world, particularly Australia, New Zealand, where the aircraft was operated as a full size type. Very, uh, very keen out there on that. 2018, we uh, linked up with the RAF 100 anniversary and built a, a Hurricane, uh, again, drawn by Matt Jones, PSSA member. Uh, all, all our own work in getting that kit manufactured, short kitted, doing the back form canopies and distributing that through Traplet uh, or Sarek uh, Traplet at this point in time. Uh, so yeah, really good, really good event and uh, nice to see a range of colour schemes again. There are a couple of duplicates, aren't there? But uh, again, each model has been 
it has been built from the same plan, but finished bespoke to uh, to the individual's needs. Some glass, some film, uh, many routes to to the slope. And our most recent mass build, we've only just run this in September last year, really, uh, delayed due to COVID, uh, was an F86 Sabre. Uh, and, and again, drawn and manufactured this time by two of our PSSA members. Uh, so I think Martin's on the call. Martin and Gordon uh, manufactured nearly 100 of these kits from home on a home CNC machine, distributed them around the world. We had Canopy's VAC form for us from Vortex VAC forms. Uh, great great community behind the, just getting the thing up and running really. Uh, but yeah, we, everyone's uh, pushed the boat out on finish. We've all learned a lot about planking of complex shape fuse lodges with this one. It's all traditionally built, built up uh, and, uh, and finishes results in a great scale model. Some of these yet to be flown actually. We struggled with wind on the day of the event. We didn't have enough uh, energy in the wind to test fly these models. Uh, so I'm conscious there's still a few sabers yet to be test flown. Uh, but uh, Good, good, uh, good event, and we've got a good write up in RCM about that. That's about it, you'll be glad to know. I'm, I've probably been talking for too long. I, the, the last picture just shows our weekend activities uh, last Sunday when uh, we, we were fortunate enough to be meeting by chance on the day of the Centenary World Record event. Uh, we were down at the Bulk in South Wales. It was a uh, east southeasterly wind, which meant the guys had to put a hell of a lot of effort in tromping all the way to the edge of the crest, which is one of the most aggressive slopes on the bulk series. Uh, very difficult to land without damaging due to the heavy rotors in, in high strength easterly winds. But uh, yeah, we put 12 models in the air in good time ahead of midday. Unfortunately, we did have a midair, and so we've registered 10, uh, done our bit for the uh, centenary world record. And I know. Myself and all the guys are very keen to, to see the uh, the write-up and the publication of the results of that as and when they're due. So we're really glad, very proud to be able to take part of that as part of the PSSA. So thank you for listening. That's that's the end of my story, really. It's only an overview of PSS and PSSA activity, but I'm hoping that that's uh, given you an insight into the sort of uh, flying that we do and the types of models that we enjoy operating. Uh, and just to finish off, really, as I said, if you want to join us at any of our events, even if you don't fly PSS yet, please do come and join us and, and spectate and bring the sports model to get some slope time with us. Uh, that's that's uh, more than welcome. That would be great to see you there. So thank you for the opportunity. And I'll finish and have a glass of water if that's OK. No, you're not quite finished yet, Phil. <laughs> We've still got a few questions. No problem. OK, so another question from Chris Bradbury. When you're converting models, let's say like that ARTF, Ripmax, Spitfire, do you still keep the center of gravity in the same position or do you air towards a more nose heavy um, uh, CG for safety? There's no need to air to a, a more forward CG to fly as a, as a slope sawer. The, the model should have a similar center of gravity to how it would be flown on the flat field. Uh, okay. No change required. Yeah, that, that, that's good. The next question was really about the EPP. Where do you get the EPP from? Well, it, it's very, very difficult to come by unless you buy it in huge quantities these days. And that's why we're seeing a lot less of it. When, when I built the Sea Fury, uh, Vortex VAT forms had the ability at the time in Leicester to pull together relatively small batches. But even then, we're having to buy sort of transit van volumes of material, uh, which would then last him perhaps six months in kit manufacture. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's died a death. I wouldn't know myself now where to get hold of that. I'm afraid the uh, the automotive industry has taken ownership of the product and made it impossible to buy unless you're buying shiploads now. Okay. Yeah. So you're back to sort of white foam and uh, blue and pink foam. Well, we're, yeah, we're all holders in the PSSA. So when you buy Italian, it comes with a big chunk of EPP packaging. We, we tend to stick it behind the sofa for later use. <laughs> but uh, yeah, buying it in, in, in volumes required to cut fuselages and wings, it, I, I wouldn't know immediately where to go unless you're buying it in huge quantities. Yeah. I find there's quite a good online supplier for white polystyrene foam. They're called yes. Eccleston Heart. Um, yeah. The material, it, it's quite adequate for modelling purposes. But I, I, yeah, like you say, EPP. I, I've never seen it, so I wondered if you had a secret. I'm afraid not, no. 
Okay, that's good. I don't think we've got any other questions. Oh, yeah. Um, it was a question about the T-33 shooting star. That was the nice photo you had with the shooting star, wasn't it? Uh, I can where you were Where you were doing T-33 um, shooting star. So in the one of the last photos, we, you, you had a pair of gliders. Um, I'll just try and find it again. Yeah, zip, zip, zip back. It's coming. A little bit more. <laughs> it was, I think it was on the Great Orm where the... Um, yeah, here we go. That's, that was yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, it's so, coming. Yeah. There you go. That's the one. Like, um, like those are shooting stars, aren't they? They are indeed. They, I mean, if you knew the T33 inside and out, you would immediately recognize that the fuselage is, is quite grossly slimmed down. These, these were yeah. kits that were imported from the States, actually, and sadly no longer produced, but a brilliant model and still flying today. We imported three of them. Uh, it must have been around 2003 when we started to, to take interest in these, and they've been flying ever since. They are indestructible. Uh, and the, mine, mine's the rear aircraft there with the black top. It, uh, it's had two different color schemes now because it got tatty. It's still got the same servos in the wing when I built it in 2003, believe it or not. One of the uh, servos has a horrible glitch issue at times, but uh, needs to be cut out and replaced. They just keep going and going and going. Wonderful machine. Yeah. Uh, what is the construction? It's all solid EPP. Uh, oh, so, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, and then on, the, on this particular model, it's... Uh, the instructions in the kit describe how to wrap the EPP in uh, in glass weave tape, and and you do it in a in a cross weave manner to build strength where strength is needed. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the the majority of the airframe is 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 bound in this glass weave tape, and then on top of that, you can apply pro film or solar film, uh, which is what we've done here to get the color schemes. Uh, but yeah, very durable, and uh, the models when ballasted, pitch like this, they they weigh in at about seven seven and a half pounds. Uh, on a really windy day, I can get 20 sub C cells as ballast over the center of gravity in the cavity in the fuselage. They're the 72 inch span. Yeah. And they fly wonderfully. Flying them as a pair, knowing that they both weigh the same and have similar flying characteristics, you can stick. It's like the red arrows at times. It's a wonderful formation flying. Yeah. Because you know, maybe, you can that's, have... maybe that's your next mass build project, Phil. Deeper. Well, I know there's a lot of people that would like to see more of them in the UK. As I say, unfortunately, the kit's no longer produced and uh, EPP is hard to come by. But yeah, the T-33 makes, as we said earlier, jet trainers, vintage jet trainers. The, the full size was designed to be fairly benign, to enable young startup yeah. pilots to survive, weren't they? So those, those same characteristics read across into the model. You've not got a sweat wing, you know, relatively clean lines and good span, good wing area. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're quite a friendly design and great fun. Nice, nice looking aeroplane as well. Very good. Okay. I think we've um, got no open questions, Phil. Um, great presentation. Um, didn't realise, uh, as, as I say, no open questions. What construction type and aircraft type would you recommend for a first build PSS model? If if the uh, if the individual's keen on on building from a plan, I, I would always point towards uh, a couple of the the, the bolster builds. Uh, none of them are very challenging in in construction. There's no real difficult construction in there. But I think it's really nice to to do the build personally. Have it you know build that relationship with the model finish it exactly how you want it. So I, I would always point to something like the uh, the Jet Provost that's behind me is a great little all-around trainer or the Andy Conway Hawk, again, a model that would push for years as a first-timer. The, the, the size of the model uh, is one thing because you're not putting hundreds of pounds of investment into it. They're relatively small and easy to operate. Uh, simple two-channel operation yeah. and good all-around machines as well. So you can fly them in relatively light winds. Uh, up to uh, up to high winds, you know, the, the jet probably still flying 60, 65 mile an hour winds if needed. Labor. I would certainly point people towards your website because it was, there was a great resource there of the plans and, and what have you. I think it was about 85 plans. That's correct. That you, yeah. that you had um, uh, access to there. Okay, Phil, that was a 
great presentation. Uh, certainly, um, I didn't realise how much work was going on, particularly with those larger models like the Antonov and the B-52. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's great. Um, thank you very much. Um, and maybe we'll get you back again next um, next winter, maybe, um, and give us a, a rundown on some of your meetings that you've had this year. I see that you've got meetings um there's a meeting towards the end of this month, isn't there, at the Great Hall? Uh, yes, there is. 28th and 29th of May, we're in London there again for the weekend. So, uh, yeah, okay. hopefully the, the weather gods will be kind and we'll get two good days flying then, yes, hopefully. Yeah, you deserve it. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much for the opportunity again this evening. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I'm going to stop the uh, YouTube feed now.